to our first witness of the day, the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan from Wisconsin. We appreciate your time today. It is no surprise to anybody on this panel or those watching uh, that you have an interest in this process that you perhaps more than any person on Capitol Hill and indeed throughout the nation um, know more about this process and about the budget and appropriations process than virtually anybody. So your testimony is critical to the outcome uh, that this committee will achieve uh, sometime later this year. We have received your written statement. It will be part of the formal record. You have five minutes to deliver your oral remarks. And the floor is yours, Mr. Speaker, with our thanks for being here. Thank you very much, Chairman. I've never actually had my remarks ever time limited since I've had this job, so this is going to be a challenge here. <laughs> yeah, no magic minutes around exactly. here. Exactly. So uh, first of all, it's, it's, it's a wonderful to be here. Um, I can't tell you how um, excited I am about the fact that this committee exists. Obviously, I had a big hand in making sure that this occurred. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, co-chairs, uh, Lowe and Womack, uh, for, for doing this work. Um, I'm going to stick with some of my written testimony, then I'm going to go off the cuff. Uh, as you know, I chaired the Budget Committee, uh, chaired the Ways and Means Committee. I've spent basically my adult life working within the 1974 Budget Act and the budget process. Uh, so I have uh, a great deal of background in this area. And um, I think that this panel uh, is so urgent at this time. Um, as things stand, I think we are um, basically falling well short of our tasks. Uh, we continue to fail the taxpayer. Uh, worse, we continue to set ourselves up for failure with the way the budget process works these days. And it is obviously, clearly, time for a new approach. And I think I can sp feel comfortable speaking on behalf of Republicans and Democrats in saying that. Um, <clears throat> so because I have this background, I just want to basically um, give you a sense of my perspective on this. Um, whenever, you know, there's a new speaker, there's hope for a new process. Uh, members clamor for more influence and more input. Uh, I experienced that. Uh, I came in not running up the leadership ladder, but up the committee chair ladder, um, wanting to decentralize uh, power in this place, empowering the members. Um, I've got to say, the way this budget process works effectively is it centralizes power too much in this institution. Uh, we do not have a decentralized power structure here. We have a centralized power structure here that is not fair to members of Congress, their constituents, and the taxpayers. So the way I look at this, the budget and appropriations process, it starts with good intentions. It has a good foundation. You have a tight timeline. Even under the best circumstances, that tight timeline leaves no room for detours. Uh, invariably, what happens now is the process seizes up, and not long after, the whole thing falls apart. And as the clock ticks down, final decisions are kicked up to leadership, and that kicks back a final members that members a final numbers a final product that members find unsatisfactory. And we sit in these rooms, the four corners, so to speak, and 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 look over 1.3 trillion dollars, for example, and make decisions that ought to be made by the members who spend all of their time on the committees, doing the research, doing the oversight. They're the ones who should be making these decisions. So we do not have a functional process, and it is, it, the power is too concentrated. So I would even say calling this organized chaos is too generous a description. And so to me, all of these omnibuses and these continuing resolutions, they're a little more than local anesthetics. Uh, the, 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 it's like an anesthesia, but the, the pain goes away, but the problem doesn't go away. And it just feeds on itself, fueling pessimism on all sides. Members become less engaged. The public becomes more disenchanted. And with each of these stumbles, with each new year, we're handing over more spending decisions to the executive branch. So I see this as a squandering of our institutional duties of oversight. I see this of squandering um, the, the, the talent we have among our members on the committees of jurisdiction, like the Appropriations Committee. And more fundamentally, it's an abdication of our critical power of the purse for the legislative branch of government. So I'm one of those people who's, who's I see the glass of life as half full. I'm, I'm an unapologetic optimist. And I do believe we can solve tough problems, even this one. And that's why I'm encouraged at what you're doing here. Um, the reforms that we need, I think, are bold, but I think they're right in front of us. I think some of the ideas we've been talking about for years, they're ready. They're, they're time to do it. And, um, you know, the way I look at this thing is uh, – 
we may not be able to change the deadlines, but we can change the calendar. Uh, look at what we're doing right now and look at the entire appropriations process. Uh, how many of you, and I asked senators here, I see you know just a couple, how many of you think the Senate is ever going to again do 12 appropriation bills, separate appropriation bills, 12 conference reports before the fiscal year? Not gonna happen. Let's just get on with acknowledging that and come up with a process so we actually go back to regular order and appropriations. And this is why I ultimately think the best idea of all the ones that we've been looking at, and I've done hearing after hearing after hearing, uh, eight years uh, at the Budget Committee as either ranking member or chairman, Ways and Means Chair, I think biennial budgeting is the smartest way to go. And I think biennial budgeting has great bipartisan roots. So it, to me, offers a path to rewriting the process, not just reforming it. It makes budgeting an ongoing process instead of all these demoralizing fits and starts that we have. It brings renewed transparency and accountability, and it sets us up for, to be better stewards of taxpayer dollars. Um, there are a lot of different proposals I've seen on biennial budgeting. I, myself, have uh, introduced multiple Congresses, the Biennial Budgeting and Enhanced Oversight Act. I think the recent repros, and this, is, this really takes a lot of Senate involvement, the, the recent proposal by uh, Chairman Enzi makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, do six appropriation bills one year, six appropriation bills the next year. So you're appropriating every year, and you're doing it in a workload that is doable. And you have biennial budgeting on top of that with reconciliation instructions. And I think it's not too much to ask for the way the Senate works to do six this year and then six the next year. That, to me, is probably one of the best ideas I have seen. I don't think this violates any partisan issue. This isn't an ideological thing. This is just how can Congress work better. The way I look at this, if properly implemented, this will empower members to do a deeper dive on the most troublesome issues, and it will enhance their ability to oversee the executive branch. I think it will reinvigorate member participation. It will encourage actual conference committees and actual conference reports on individual appropriation bills. Um, and I think it will also enhance the importance of reconciliation. Uh, in 2013, Patty Murray and I got together uh, as budget chair and she was as budget chairs and we put together a two-year deal then uh, John Boehner and President Obama put together a two-year deal then we just recently put together a two-year cap deal so we have sort of demonstrated that we can put together two-year deals two-year spending cap deals that work but now we want to have I think an appropriations process that follows that kind of a track so the way I look at these things is Take a look at the record we have. I'm just going to read from my notes here. The last, uh, last fall, the House passed all 12 appropriation bills on time. This is the first time the House has done that since 2009. Uh, the last time the House and the Senate passed all 12 appropriation bills on time was in 1994. So 12% of the current members were here for that. I was a think tank staffer at the time. 12% of the people in the House were here the last time we passed all the 12 appropriation bills. So we have a, an entire generation of people's representatives have become accustomed to, if not acclimated to, a failed budget process. So we have basically taken this failed budget process as, as just the way things work and there's nothing you can do about it. Let's reject that kind of thinking. Let's reinvigorate a budget process, and, and I'm just simply giving you a suggestion as a person who's observed this process for many, many years. And this, if this body comes together and presents a plan uh, for reinvigorating the budget process, I really believe we, will, we, we can get buy-in. And I like to think that the members of Congress who have known nothing but budget dysfunction would love and welcome the day and the opportunity to actually have a reinvigorated, workable, practical budget process where every member of Congress has, has more franchise, more influence, more say-so, and that means the taxpayer is going to be more respected at the end of the day. So I really believe, as a person who fought to create this committee in the last omnibus appropriations bill, I think that you have a great opportunity in front of you I think a lot of these di ideas I buy are bipartisan. In the old days, as in like 10 years ago, it used to be appropriators against budgeteers or against authorizers. This doesn't have to be the case. This, this does not have to be appropriators versus other committees because the appropriators themselves are losing um, their ability to affect change. 
When we do these omnibus appropriation bills, we are taking the pen away from the appropriators and writing these bills with just a few people. By having a biennial process with, and it, it, with six bills, the appropriators write those bills. The appropriators go to conference committee. You have a budget process that is more likely to be adhered to. And so that, to me, seems like one of the sweet spots we could have with a bipartisan, bicameral compromise to make this budget process work. And I simply submit this for your consideration, and I hope you, you, you really come up with something that we can take and be proud of and restore this branch's power of the purse. And with that, thank you very much. We, we appreciate your comments this morning, Mr. Speaker. Um, to be respectful of your time, uh, do you have a couple of minutes sure. in the event that any of our members would like to ask a question? The chair would recognize anyone that might have a question for the speaker this morning. Anyone? Senator Bennett. I, I just would ask for your impression about how what has caused the centralization that you described? Why have so many members of Congress yielded to so few the decisions that are made around here about budgeting and, you know, sort of made themselves props in somebody else's play? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. So I, a House guy could easily go beat up the Senate for having cloture and motions to proceed and all of the rest of that, uh, but I will resist the temptation. I think it is easier to push decisions elsewhere and not own, um, own the consequences. I think if we have a structure that, uh, that, that has a chance of passing, I think people gave up on thinking the appropriation process works. I think people gave up thinking we're going to do 12 bills. Well, first of all, think of the calendar. You get the president's budget in March, then you have a statutory deadline by April 15th to pass a budget resolution which gives you the budget instructions, the 302 A's, which then the committee goes and writes the B's. And then you may start your appropriations process, hopefully as early as May, but probably not till June. And you've got to get 12 appropriation bills done through the House and the Senate conference before September 30th. So the thing backs up and it just doesn't work. And so most members just don't think it's going to happen. So they don't, they don't invest themselves into participating in a process that's going to yield results because they just know the calendar just doesn't work. So that's why I believe if you have a, a, a biennial budget with, with the caps already sort of preordained, you know, every two years you rewrite those caps, I would encourage annual reconciliation, but you have an appropriations process that can start earlier and you have half as many bills to do, I believe members will have more faith and confidence that they can actually get the work done. So they'll actually participate and get involved in actually getting a good product. Because what in invariably happens is we do a CR to buy us a little more time, and then we have the appropriators kind of write their bills and move it up, and then it comes to, you know, the speaker, the minority leader, the majority leader, and the minority leader in the Senate, and then we put together some massive bill. That is not a good way to run government. It is, it, the power is too, I'm the person who gets the power, I don't want it. It's too concentrated. It is not how government should work. Because the person who is the chairman and ranking member of the Energy and Water Committee are spending time after time in hearings, reading GAO reports, listening to inspector generals. They know their jurisdiction better than anybody else. They know how these bills should be written. They know how taxpayer dollars are being um, um, guarded or not. And they should write the bills, not somebody who's you know, juggling every other thing in Congress. That, to me, is the breakdown in the process. And by having the executive branch come to an appropriations committee where they know that that committee is going to be writing their bill, I think the executive branch is going to be far more responsive to the legislative branch and the power of the purse because they know it's not going to be some omnibus. They know it's going to be that person I'm looking at across the rostrum is going to be writing my appropriations bill. I think they're going to make our government far more responsive and accountable if that is the case.